Bonjour, and welcome to the show. This is Boom Bust. I'm Erin Aid, and here's what we have in store for you today. First up, we look into the bitter battle between investor Carl Icahn and EA. The activist investor and online retail giant are throwing punches back and forth. Icon playing a rope of dope. We'll tell you all about it coming right up. Plus, we're bringing you part two of my interview with Alex Daly. He'll tell us about the world and future of mobile technology. You definitely won't want to miss that. And finally, it's the end of the week, which means it's viewer feedback day here on Boom Bust. Edward Harrison and I address your questions, comments, concerns live right on the show. You won't want to miss a moment. So let's get to it. Our lead story today, the bitter battle between activist investor Carl Icahn and the online auction site eBay. Thursday, Icahn amped up his already heated clash with eBay by challenging the online retailer to a duel. True story. Not a 20 paces pistol type duel, but a live TV debate. Now, Icahn says that the current eBay board is not fit to decide what is best for the shareholders. Icon recommended that eBay sell its electronic payment unit, PayPal, and he's trying to convince eBay shareholders to press the company to spin off its financial transaction arm. eBay quickly rejected Icon's challenge, saying, quote, we will not be going head to head against Carl Icon. Now, this response prompted Icon to compare the online retailer to an oppressive government regime, saying, quote, it doesn't surprise me that they, eBay, don't want to have a debate because in a totalitarian state, there are no debates. What they don't seem to realize is that unlike in a totalitarian state, there are people, shareholders, that can answer back. Now, Icon says eBay director Scott Cook shouldn't be on the board of the $75 billion company because Cook is also founder and chairman of Intuit. Intuit has a relationship with payment processing startup Square, which directly competes with PayPal. Now, Icon also criticized venture capitalist Mark Andreessen for profiting off discarded eBay assets, including the online voice company Skype. I like Skype. Now, on Thursday, eBay brought out the big, big guns founder and chairman Pierre Omidyar, who famously became a billionaire at age 31 when eBay went public back in 1998. Pierre rejected Icon's request to split off PayPal and said he stands by Andreessen and Cook. And I mean, he would say that. Andreessen and Cook and Pierre, they're all icons of Silicon Valley. They're greatly respected and admired, and they probably truly believe that they haven't done anything, anything unethical or anything wrong. But this sort of wheeling and dealing is common in the tech world. And when the technology industry was still in its infancy, People actually turned a blind eye to these kinds of conflicts of interest when it came to corporate governance. But that was back then. Now, however, internet companies are an important part of the global economy. Companies in this sector have larger market caps than traditional blue chip companies, and they rake in billions in IPOs. So maybe Carl Icahn has a point. Companies this important should be extolled rather than condemned. <laughs> Yesterday, we aired the first part of my conversation with technology expert Alex Daly. Now, he's a senior editor at Casey Research, and today is part two of that interview, and we want to talk to Alex about mobile, as this is an increasingly focus and the focal point for many tech companies, specifically the cloud technology. Now, it's a word that we hear a lot, but what does it actually mean? I asked Alex this very question, and here's what he had to say. So the cloud is this idea that storing your documents and your data up in the internet as opposed to keeping it locally provides you with more convenience and maybe more security. Though there are a lot of questions about that floating around today on the security side uh, with Bitcoin and everything that's happening. I think the convenience of the cloud is no doubt. You see these companies like 
Box.com, uh, Dropbox, and you see Google with Drive, Microsoft with its SkyDrive, which has now been renamed to OneDrive. The idea that we can manage and own all users' data in the cloud means that they can use three, four, five, ten devices simultaneously and still have access to all of their stuff, their music, their documents, their videos. Uh, it's very convenient for consumers and it's really driven the tablet movement and the smartphone movement by providing us with access to our documents on both sides. So I think the cloud is a natural underpinning to an increase in mobility and this continued move to smaller devices and lots of different form factors. What about the concern though of security? Yeah, security is definitely a big concern in the cloud. One of the things you have to ask yourself is, you know, are you content keeping data in a place where the systems administrators of a company can get to it, where uh, hackers can get to it, where it can be intercepted in transit? Companies take this security threat really, really seriously, but we've already seen some very, very big hacks. We saw problems with uh, Dropbox early on, where there was a hack that allowed people to enter basically any Dropbox account and read any of their data. The company now assures us that, that that's been patched, but then again, they assured us that they were secure before that <laughs> happened. I think the lesson for consumers is don't keep anything in the cloud or out of your control uh, that you don't want anybody else to have access to. But the overwhelming majority of our documents and things, do you care if somebody really sees your pictures from your last Acapulco trip? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Turning well, out though. Your trip's a little more fun than mine. <laughs> I don't know about that. Regardless, it's kind of those private things you like to keep private. But I want to turn now, Alex, to uh, Apple. And Apple's growth, it's tumbled in recent years. Now, the company is using cash to buy back shares. So the question is, is Apple stock a good deal at these levels? I don't think Apple stock is a good deal at these levels because ultimately Apple is still assigned the Apple premium and until they can find a way to grow, that multiple is going to continue to shrink. You're going to see their PE multiple come back down in line with other companies of their size, with the Oracles, Microsoft, and IBM of the world. I think Apple's biggest challenge is that growth that you mentioned. They need to find another product line, another line of business that can add 10% or more to the top line growth before they excite investors again, before they can keep that multiple stable or get it going back up. So I don't like Apple at these prices. Uh, I definitely uh, I think that the entire large cap tech industry, though, is relatively overvalued right now. Most of the run up in 2013 is attributable to an increase in P.E. ratios and not to an increase in underlying profitability. And that, to me, is scary as an investor. I don't think that profits catch up to this market before it corrects back down, both Apple and the other large cap players. Alex, in your opinion, strategically, what do you think is the best move for Apple from here in order to best leverage its existing mobile presence? If I, if I knew what the best strategic move was for Apple, I'd be CEO of the company probably. <laughs> what I can tell you is the opportunities they've yet to capture include China and India. They don't have enough presence in either of those markets and they are making moves into them. But ultimately it's going to take a new product and that's why I say I can't predict what that is. It's going to take a new product line. When Microsoft had a top line growth problem in the late 1990s and early 2000s when Windows really tapered off, they got into new businesses. They got into servers. Servers is now a bigger business than core Windows for them. They've gotten into a, a bunch of different uh, businesses. SharePoint is now a multi-billion dollar business for them. Microsoft has been able to grow lots of four and five billion dollar businesses and grow itself to 70 billion in revenue. Apple's got to ask itself the question, how does it move another 10 billion dollars in product? What is that business they're not in yet? And thus I can see them getting into, as Google is, more of the home automation, more of the sectors where we start to use computing, but it's our primary goal isn't to actually be on the web or surfing content, uh, but more of this ubiquitous aspect. Maybe the living room is the tackle with the Apple TV. Maybe it's uh, wearable computing, I doubt that one, uh, but I think home automation is definitely a possibility for Apple. And speaking of Google, what do you make of Google's mobile strategy? Uh, Google's mobile strategy is, is uh, interesting in the sense that it's effectively set fire to everyone else's home and thus you'll have the nicest one standing. Uh, with Android, their idea was to, look, if we can't compete fairly in this space, we'll put out something for free. We'll, that'll be much more attractive to the OEMs. We'll put out something that's very customizable. So companies like Samsung 
people feel like they can still differentiate themselves. So they did what Microsoft once did to Apple. They learned from that playbook, did the same thing, but they also had Microsoft to compete with, so they had to do it for free. So Google right now spends billions of dollars supporting its mobile business, but really doesn't bring in much revenue from it except with search. And whether search on mobile is fully monetizable is still a big question. To this day, Google has still spent more on its mobile strategy than it's managed to bring back in. But the alternative to that was to not do anything at all and to risk losing mobile devices to companies like Microsoft that could bring in an operating system and a search engine to the party. And if they did that, they were just going to lose out on this market altogether. So I think they made the right investments, even if it's not cash flow creative today. Okay. And uh, I also want to ask you, that's a good point there on uh, what you said about cash flow, but just this week, Nokia, they revealed a heavily customized version of Android for its new cheapy smartphone line, and they're designed specifically for emerging markets. And the phones were de-Googled, just like Amazon's tablets. Now, the question is, doesn't Android leave Google's mobile strategy open to this kind of platform hijacking? Absolutely. Uh, when they put it out as an open source project, I think they knew that was always a threat. They have this, this, this underlying threat that someone can take the core Android. I think what Google's realized is that a phone with its services, a, a tablet with its services, is inherently more valuable to the consumer. Uh, a Amazon, with its distribution power, is the only company who's managed to take a debadged Android and turn it into something successful. And even then, it pales in comparison relative to what Samsung and Apple both have done in tablets. So while it's good for Amazon to keep its Amazon customers inside its universe, it hasn't necessarily lit the consumer world on fire. And I certainly don't think that the Nokia X is, if it's even to survive the, the absorption by Microsoft that's going to come very, very soon. That's a big question, whether Microsoft will let the Nokia X, the Android Power Nokia, survive, whether it'll treat the company more like it does Skype and sort of keep its hands off of it, uh, or whether it's going to bring it in-house and, and strip it down and do the connected platform that it always does, follow its same old Microsoft playbook, one that frankly hasn't turned out all that well with the exception of Xbox over the last few years. Alex, I want to quickly ask you this question. We only have about a minute left, but uh, can you give me your views on the NSA and hacking? Do you see the NSA's clandestine activities as a threat to U.S. technology companies, basically in terms of cloud-based business models specifically? I don't think the NSA is a threat to the cloud-based business model. I think the one thing it's really a potential threat to is our ability to export. You're already seeing a sort of uh, fallout for Cisco and other companies internationally, especially with the most tenuous relationship we have, with, which is China. We have that wonderful love-hate relationship with China. Um, you're seeing already Cisco and other large vendors like that getting blocked in these countries. So I think the NSA you know, made a big political misstep in keeping this stuff secret. It, uh, a lot of this information started to become public a couple years ago. Then at the, game, at the same time, we've been doing the same thing to China. China has been hacking the United States for a long time, just like we've been hacking them, both corporate and at the government level. Uh, and we've blocked Huawei and other companies from providing infrastructure equipment in our country. So you're seeing this sort of war of technology companies and the government getting involved in the hacking is making it hardest for the largest cap players. But I think beyond that, it really doesn't have a lot of implications for business. What it does have is a lot of implications for the consumers who have to ask the question again of whether they trust the people who host their data. Alex, thank you so much for your time and your insight. We really appreciate having you on the show and hope to have you back soon. Well, thanks. That was Alex Daly, senior editor at Casey Research. Time now for a quick break, but stick around because when we return, we're bringing you the best of the best from this past week. Now, we've assembled some seriously quotable clips that you won't want to miss, so stick around for that. Plus, Edward Harrison and I tackle your viewer feedback in today's In the Margins. But as we head to a very quick break, here's a look at some of your closing numbers at the bell. Stick around. are force-fed. Two explosions near the finish line of the Boston Marathon. More than a thousand people have gathered. What is the latest that you're hearing about the number of victims? <laughs> We 
welcome Aaron Aid and Abby Martin, two of the terrific hosts on the RT Network. Boom bust, it's going to give you a different perspective. Give me one stock tip. Oh, never. I'll give you the information, you make the decision. Tell me about how breaking the set works. It's a revolution of the mind, it's a revolution of ideas and consciousness. Are you frustrated with the system? Yeah, extremely. Your politics would be described as angry. I think you? I'm a strong female. <laughs> Are you single? Now, this past week, we had some great guests on our show. Axel Merck and Doug Casey said some pretty great stuff about the intersection of the real economy and monetary policy. Plus, both Chris Martinson and Dean Baker gave us detailed previews of what to expect in 2014 here in the U.S. Take a look. The challenge is that because we faced this recovery on money printing, on asset price inflation, that as the Federal Reserve is trying to untangle itself from the mess it's gotten itself into, um, things are going to go downhill again. And the reason why that's so dependent on the Fed is because part of the recovery, for example, is based on home price recovery. While as interest rates creep up, um, we're going to get significant headwinds there. What we see is companies like Walmart struggle to make their earnings. Um, and that's not company specific. Target had problems. Amazon had problems. That means the, 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 there are, sure, there are a few wealthy folks that can spend money. But if you actually have to work for a living and uh, have a standard handicraft, it's going to be a very, very difficult challenge to make a living. And so this recovery is really based on the Fed. And if the Fed is sneezing or if Jan Yellen is catching a cold, we going to have a problem in the economy. Put my finger first and foremost on the um, actions of central banks around the world. Uh, their reaction to any weakness in the economy is to print up more currency units. And this is happening all over the world, in the United States, in Europe, in China, in Japan, and in all these minor countries as well. So uh, what I expect to see, uh, even though we have some volatility now, it's nothing compared to what we're going to see uh, by the end of the year, and certainly within a year or two. You're going to see much higher levels of inflation all around the world and uh, actual financial chaos, in my opinion. Wow. Now, there's been a bit of chatter about moving to safe haven assets. Is now the time to buy gold, in your opinion? Well, let's put it this way. Uh, there have been uh, two times in recent history when gold was not just a superb asset to hold, but a superb speculation. That was in 1971, mm -hmm. when it was $35 an ounce. It subsequently went to 850 And in 2001, when it was about $250 an ounce, and it subsequently went to 1900 And I point out that in 2001, at 250 it was cheaper in real terms than it was in 1971 at $35. Okay, now that said, it's a little over 1300 now. Right. So it's not the giveaway bargain that it was 10 years ago, 12 years ago. But uh, the main reason you buy gold is because it's the only financial asset it's not simultaneously somebody else's liability. So that's the reason you buy gold today. It's a good speculation, not a one-way speculation anymore. But yes, you should own gold. Everybody should own gold, a significant amount of gold. Well, Aaron, we've got a lot of mixed signals here. Obviously, uh, I'm not a huge fan of using Treasury yields to tell us much anymore at this point because the Fed has so distorted that market, one of many markets they, that they've distorted so badly. But as you rightly note, June 19th and 20th of 2013 with Fed taper talk wasn't just bonds that sold off. Everything sold off. We saw stocks, bonds, and uh, commodities all take big hits at that point in time. That could be a, a measure of front running. Uh, I think it was more a measure of the extent to which people had somehow thought the Fed was always going to just continue with the free money forever. Even the thought of the Fed stopping the free money obviously is going to have huge impacts for all sorts of markets. The equity market in particular is really very much hinged at this point on the idea that the Fed will 
print and print more always. Now, are the rise in prices, uh, bond prices, and the fall in yields, is this a sign of economic weakness in your opinion? Well, I, I think there's a couple of things going on. One of the First of all, this is a global story now, and we have to look at the flood of liquidity that's been put across the entire globe, and we watched it wash into places very beneficially, like Turkey, like India, like Venezuela, like Argentina. Now that that's starting to wash back out, it's a very unvirtuous cycle as it starts to, to come back in. Where is that money when it starts to rush out of those peripheral places? Well, it rushes back into the core. So I'm expecting to see things like rises in Treasury bonds uh, in the United States to actually reflect a lot of money coming back looking for a place to go. And let's be honest, a lot of big money is very uncomfortable rushing into equities at these prices. We even saw recent things where we saw uh, the short-term money, the 30-day and under paper at the Treasury go negative for periods of time, which means that people trust that source of getting their money stored and back from the government more than they trust other institutions. So in this story, I think we have this huge flood of liquidity that went out, and now it's coming back in, and that's going to impact uh, treasury prices, maybe even equities for a bit. Well, there's two things going on, I think, the main forces. First off, the, the growth in the second half of last year was inflated by inventory accumulations. We had very, very rapid paces of inventory accumulation. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone could think that would be continued. So if you pull out the inventories, the growth was somewhere a little over 2%. So that's kind of the underlying growth rate. That's what you would expect it to fall back to once you have the adjustments. So there's two stories here as we get into the first quarter. One, a slower pace of inventory accumulation. That means a drag on growth. That's a negative. Second thing, weather. Um, I, I was really weather. I, I keep t no, no. I, been, I was poo pooing that for the longest time. Should I stop poo pooing? Let's listen. Well, well no, no. <laughs> we always get bad weather in December and right. January, so that's not news. But this was definitely worse, and I'm saying that because I got stuck in Minneapolis because of the snowstorm. <laughs> no, no. Because I personally felt it. But, but no, it, it definitely was. I, I would say through January it wasn't noticeably worse, but through February it definitely was. Right. So, so I would say that was had an effect, slowing growth. You know half a percent, maybe as much as three quarters of a percentage point. So I think weather really did have an impact. Do you think the weather had had something to do with uh, extreme weather in places that aren't familiar with it? It wasn't like a lot of snow in New York where they can handle it and they uh, can accommodate it. It was Atlanta and other places. That's right. You had a lot of areas in the south that don't typically get such severe winters. So, right. uh, so the fact that, I mean, that, that's why I was poo-pooing it originally. So, you know, that, that New York got snow or, boil, you know, that, that Shocker. happens. Shocker. That happens in January. So that's not news. So it is when you get in Atlanta and it shuts down much of the South. Oh, Mother Nature. Now, that was the best of the best from this past week. Time now for In the Margins. <laughs> it's In the Margins time with dun -dun -dun -dun, Edward Harrison. Now, every Friday, Ed Harrison and I, we put you, the viewer, into the driver's seat, letting you steer the show with your comments, questions, and concerns, all sent to us throughout the week via Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Now, the first comment that we have, it comes from Disco Pro Joe, great name, by the way, Disco Pro Joe. He writes, or she, in response to Doug Casey's interview on Tuesday, Japan doesn't need Abenomics. It needs Austrian economics. Bear in mind that if wages fall while consumer prices are falling even faster, then real wages are rising. Now, two comments on that thread had responses. First was this direct response. It was from Trevor Pickersgill, also a great name, who wrote, that has actually been happening in Japan for 15 years. Wages and income stagnated in the mid-1990s, while a combination of things caused steady price deflation. But the only result has been anemic GDP growth. Then, separately, Neptune's Dreams wrote, corporations will never raise wages. That's not what they do. They keep wages low to increase profit for their investors. Trying to change that would be like trying to force water back up a waterfall by saying, please. I love that analogy. Ed, what do you think about this? Do you love the analogy? <laughs> I do. You know, it's, uh, it's a really intractable problem. And I think that uh, Japan is something that we're going to be looking to. We, as uh, developed economies, both in the United States and Europe, because I think that both Europe and North America could face the same problems in terms of high levels of private sector debt and also stagnant wages. So the question is, if you have high levels of private sector debt and stagnant wages, 
how can you get uh, GDP growth uh, that continues to be high? Every right. single time there's a recession, you know, that debt gets in the way and you basically have uh, the economy going down, falling tremendously. You have financial mm -hmm. crises the way that we've had before. And so what we've seen in Japan basically is, is that they've had that over and over again. Uh, you know, three or four times over the last 20 yeah. years, and they haven't been able to get out of it. Uh, what I would say is, is, is that you're never going to get out of that trap, as, especially when a private sector debt is high, unless you move to full employment first. Because okay. you're never going to get wage growth without full employment. There you go. We heard it here from Ed. <laughs> now, our next comment comes via YouTube from Plawble28, I hope I'm saying that right, who writes, WTF, X worldcom MCI <laughs> assets are part of Verizon. Everyone knows that except for your producer. My resume is on their, on my way. Well, Ed, uh, I, I think response, the, uh, yeah. I'll leave it to you. Touche. I, I, you know, I definitely <laughs> misspoke. It, it was Verizon. It was not uh, Comcast. And so I think it's great, actually, that we're calling this particular quote out. I, I selected it because, you know, we make mistakes. We do. It happens. And I think human, that we, wanna, uh, we want people to call us out, and, uh, and we want to we, we want to make them as infrequently <laughs> as possible. But if we do, please let us know. Now, last but not least, Dion Henderson called me out yesterday. It was for yesterday's episode when I referenced lyrics that I said were by Mary J. Blige. But nope, Dion schooled me. That's for sure. Writing "Mo Money, Mo Problems" was a biggie hit. Aaron, come on, R.I.P. Notorious. Dion, you are right. I am sorry, biggie. <laughs> would thank you as well. That is all we have for now. <laughs> have a fantastic weekend. Yeah, however, before we hit it out, you can see all segments on today's show on youtube.com slash boombustrt. You can also tweet at us at AaronAid, at EdwardNH from all of us here at Boombust. Thank you so much for watching. Catch you next time. Have a great weekend. Ciao. Bye-bye.